Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Sean Frazier, the Federal Chief Security Officer at Okta. Sean, good to have you with us. Always good to be with you, Tom. Good to see you. And let's talk about digital delivery of benefits and services. This is on the lips of pretty much every federal agency. I mean, we've got this customer experience drive and a better cybersecurity drive. Somehow it all seems to come around to the idea of a seamless experience, which itself comes down to ID. Uh, tell us what the situation is, how you see it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, the way I think about this is nothing really happens until someone tries to access or log into something. That's why identity and access management is so important. And I think over the years, we've kind of treated um, security and user experience as orthogonal things. We've, we've thought of them as being different things when the reality couldn't be further from the truth. They actually are kind of two sides of the same coin. You can't have a good user experience unless it's a secure user experience for obvious reasons. I mean, you certainly don't want... Um, attackers having access to your data, because that's not a good user experience to have to figure out how do I, you know, let the authorities know, how do I protect my information, how do I keep my information private. So having strong security constructs is actually part and parcel to good user experiences. I, and when we talk about security, I always talk about, a, you know, user experience is the unwritten rule of security, which is almost the requirement r- rather than kind of the detriment. Then what should agencies do beyond what they're doing now? I mean, pretty much they follow the standard organizational approaches. You put in your username and then you create a password. Their site remembers that. Sometimes if it's sophisticated, it will require you to re-authenticate in some manner if you come in from a different IP address. You know, yeah, I think, yeah, I think agencies should really be focusing on, um, you know, how do we get away from the password? And there's a lot of good technology over the last handful of years that has helped us do that. Because that has been one of the challenges for a lot of government agencies is that inside for my employees, I've got really strong um, identity proofing. I have strong access and user experience on management with a smart card. We can't do that to citizens and we can't do that to the public. So the public can't use smart cards. I mean, they could, but it'd be very expensive infrastructure for us to stand up, be very cumbersome. People like my mom would lose a smart card every every week and you'd have to go through the process of, of reissuing a smart card to her. So we need to kind of move towards and adopt the open standards that are happening in kind of open banking and with consumer services on ways to get rid of the the password and make better user experiences using the technology that is available today on the consumer side. So using your smartphone, using a biometric, using things like FIDO2, which is an open standard around identity and access management. And we have to really start getting away from the password because the password really has only been um, you know, putting all the onus of security on the end user by forcing the user to have unique passwords. Always change your password. Don't reuse your password. Um, and this is really, it, it, we were kind of you know, hit this space of password fatigue where users are just tired of it. So they're writing it on sticky notes. They're using the same one for banking as they do for Gmail, as they do for their business logins. So we have to get away from that. We have to deploy secure, you know, strong, secure, single sign-on. And we have to leverage these technologies that people have in their commercial world to get rid of that darn password. And let's back up a moment up the stream here and talk about verifying who someone is in the first place. And then you let them have this passwordless, frictionless type of log on. But first there is verifying the people are who they say they are. And that's a big, can be a big challenge. It can be a challenge, but it's it's super important because if you think about the, the, you know, kind of the world we find ourselves in two years after the pandemic or a year after the pandemic where folks have gotten access to people's, uh, um, uh, accounts for whether they be uh, unemployment accounts, benefits, or these kinds of things, and actually got access to to real credentials, but they're not the real people. Identity proofing is a super important aspect, but it also has to have less friction for the user. So we can't, uh, you know, layer on an identity proofing solution and require that user to go through all these steps and then lock them out of it and then require them to go through all more steps again if they have to to do that. So we have to be able to again build this online. So this whole kind of online concept doing it remotely or over the wire, if you will. Um, all that stuff has to kind of be built in and the retraction of that or the the resetting of that has to be built in online as well. So if I forget my you know password and I need to go through that, I can't go through some kind of manual process. We've seen that over the last couple of years where companies do identity proofing. I force users to go through kind of these this Herculean amount of process just to get access to their identity and the attackers didn't have that same friction. So we need to reverse that. Attackers get the friction, users don't. And how could that work then? Give us a sort of walk us through the technology chain for accomplishing that. So a lot of this, again, kind of shows up in some of the technology companies that we work with day in and day out. 
a lot of the organizations that know people working in banking, uh, folks like LexisNexis, folks like SoCure and these technology companies that, that kind of do this for a living. They've got a kind of an anti-fraud component to what they do as well. So they're kind of looking at the web, they're looking at the dark web, they're determining who some of these bad actors are. So they're kind of reducing the friction by identifying these bad actors ahead of time so the users don't get kind of put into the mix with the bad actors. So making sure that these, and these are all companies that are kind of born on the web, technology companies that leverage all of these different repositories of user proofing information. And they do that at the time of request and time of need. And then if the user forgets something and needs to log back in, they don't add undue friction, but there's a little bit of friction so an attacker can't go through that process as well. Interesting. Yeah. So with respect to those companies that you mentioned, they have a lot of data about people. And mm -hmm. that sounds like government should avail itself of that data in a commercial, just as another commercial customer, because that's a good way of triangulating in on someone that they are who they say they are. Absolutely. And, and that, that applies to leveraging a technology like Okta, which, you know, we provide the strong signal sign on the multi-factor authentication. We, we wire up the FIDO2 authenticators that users can use and we layer in and can work as, can think of as kind of this big identity API in the cloud where we can leverage in these different technology proofing organizations. Another good example of one that the government uses is login.gov. Login.gov is also a partner of Okta and they're providing some of that same capability to, to citizens for government agencies. It's amazing. Not every agency has gone to login.gov. More and more of them are. Tell us a little bit about login.gov, how it works exactly. So it's very similar to a lot of these other technology companies where you would, you as an organization or, or an enterprise would want to, you know, uh, interact with your consumers, your constituents or your citizens, and you would want them to be able to do that securely and strongly. And so they would leverage and enroll into login.gov and then login.gov and then pass that authentication back into the system, which might be using Okta or some other identity and access management solution. Our big philosophy here is it's all about choice. So you certainly can use login.gov. You can use one of the other folks that I mentioned. And, and by the way, you probably could use one that's off the shelf that I haven't even heard of yet, because our philosophy is being able to be API enabled. So that way the next latest and greatest technology capability that comes out, we can just adapt to that. And there is a advantage then in using a cloud hosting type of setup for this, correct? Rather than trying to have the agency put it in its own server. Yeah, there's there's always a benefit to that. And, you know, everyone kind of you know, talks about cloud services as being more about cost. To me, it's more about focus. It's allowing the agencies to focus on what they do for a living and not become an IT shop and focus on you know, their IRS, you, you have citizen services you deal with. Your, if you're Social Security Administration, you have citizen services that you deal with. That's what you do for a living. You're not an IT organization. So it's a matter of focus from that perspective. It allows you to focus on your core business. And I always tell folks, it's easy to build a thing. It's, it's hard to maintain a thing. So if you go build this thing for yourself, 18 months down the road, 24 months down the road, you've got to maintain it. You've got to update it. You've got to patch all the vulnerabilities. So the, your, your legacy tale of things you, you are responsible for becomes longer and longer. And again, it takes away money from your core services and what you do for a living. Yeah. And then walk us through the idea of multi-factor from the cloud. What forms can that take? And maybe describe how it's not just a substitute for a password. In many ways, it's almost like a temporary password but yet it's also coupled with another factor, which might be something that you own that you uniquely have. Yeah, so I look at multi-factor authentication as almost a stopgap to get us to where we need to be to kind of what I talked about with a passwordless future. Right now it's a requirement because you can't just rely on the password, but not every multi-factor authentication is created equal. And, and again, we wanna provide choice. So for example, in, in emerging countries where they don't have smartphones or not a large population of smart smartphones, maybe SMS-based multi-factor is great, even though it's not the most secure method available. And then you work all the way to the right of that spectrum, the most secure and, and you know, certainly supporting a phishing resistant factor, uh, which is called out specifically in a lot of government regulations, you know, things that, that prevent phishing, whether that be U2F, which is FIDO, or whether that be WebAuthn, which is FIDO2. Um, those are important as well. So we want to make sure we support all of those, but we're always leaning towards the phishing resistant factors because as we know with attackers, so they always kind of move up the stack. So what, now if we kind of solve the password problem by adding multi-factor, their next level is to try to attack multi-factor. So we have to be able to provide, provide a stronger multi-factor, which is that phishing resistant capability. Yeah, explain a little bit more about phishing resistant because phishing depends on someone voluntarily doing something. And so how do you protect people from voluntarily doing something that looks really realistic. 
Yeah, and that's why you've got to take the, the attacker out of the middle of that conversation. And that's what phishing resistance does. Because even if you use SMS-based multi-factor, which again, it's better than nothing. And a lot of your banks will use that. A lot of people use that in their personal lives. The attacker can still fish the multi-factor. So they can either, um, they can get that token, they can get that number, they can put it in, pretend to be you. So what the phishing resistant does is it ties the, the multi-factor process more closely to the user. So a good example of that is WebAuthn, where I've enrolled my fingerprint on my MacBook. It requires me to put my fingerprint on my MacBook to do the multi-factor. An attacker can't do that. Right. So it gets back to the something that is uniquely you. And it sounds like maybe biometrics could almost make a comeback in this type of uh, scheme. It already is. If you look at what Apple and Google and Microsoft and everyone's doing with WebAuthn over the last couple of years, biometric is the protection, me protection mechanism for this anti-phishing. So if you look at kind of where the future is headed with Touch ID and Face ID, biometric is making a big comeback. So how would this work in practice? Say someone sends, you know, some group in Russia or whatever sends an email blast that says, hey, you know, your credit card at Amazon has been turned down. Please re-enter your credentials. And someone's going to fall for it. Might be one in a million, but that's all it takes for payday, since it costs nothing to do the email. Then, how does the anti phishing mechanism work in that case? So the way it works is they send how me an email. email. Not there. Yeah. So they, they send me an email saying, "Click on this link to put in your password," and I don't have a password. So I click on that link, and it says, "Enter your password." And I think, well, I normally log in by putting my thumb, my my thumb on my my fingerprint reader for WebAuthn. I don't even have a password, so I don't know what a password is. I can't enter anything into this site. And if the attack, conversely, if the attacker comes at the at the site and tries to log into it, they don't have my thumb. So the first thing it's going to do is prop and say, "Hey, Sean, you need to log into this site, and you typically do it with WebAuthn. Here's a prompt for your thumb. They're not going to have it." Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> and so therefore they can't get to any of the back end services that, that are, that, that people think they're trying to get. Yep. Uh, in this case, it belongs to the phishing attack launcher. Exactly. So attackers will always move around again. Attacking is a business. So think about this as the, like you mentioned, it doesn't take a, a lot of resources or money to stand up a phishing site. And a matter of fact, you can go download one. You can download a phishing kit, uh, you know, a phishing kit for dummies off the internet right now. And you can turn around to fish people. A lot of people do this, but the attackers will be forced to move upstream and become more sophisticated. We have not forced them to become sophisticated because we always relied on this password as being the thing that, that stops bad people from getting access to good data. When there's no password, we're going to force them to move, move on to more creative exploits. All right, let's take a short break and continue here. After this short break, my guest is Sean Frazier, the Federal Chief Security Officer at Okta. I'm Tom Temin. This is Federal Insights, Modernizing Citizen Experiences with Cloud Identity, sponsored by Okta here on Federal News Network. 